Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us now. And yeah, thank you so much first to, to Avi and Laura for organizing this and also to Juan for helping with the platform. I know there's been a lot of work involved. And I'm super happy to have Asi, Ruha and David today here. Um, first, I want to... I'm going to start introducing everyone, so in no particular order. Um, I'm going to start with Asti. So Asti, born 1991 in Jakarta, is a performance artist, art manager, and film festival programmer. She graduated in criminology at the University of Indonesia in 2014 and then started her own artistic process since she joined um, 69 Performance Club in 2016. And later, she was experimenting in visual art with Releases Film Collective. Along with her fellow artists in 69 Performance Club, her works were performed in SMAC Museum Ghent, Transit Display Gallery in Prague, Ministry of Foreign Artists Geneva, Garasi Performance Institute Jakarta, SIPA Festival Manila, and Chimiti Roma Sini und Turkmasyarika Jakarta. She's also part of Kultur Cinema, a platform that focuses on researching the history of Indonesian cinema. And that's also what she's going to talk about today. And in, fin in film festival programming, she's involved as a manager and coordinator of Forum Festival, a film symposium as part of Archipel Jakarta International Documentary and Experimental Festival, Film Festival. Then we have Duha, born on February 23rd, 1995 in Jakarta. He is a filmmaker and curator, also completed undergraduate education at the Department of Criminology. He is a member of the Forum Lenteng and active as a participant in Melissa's Film Collective and 69 Performance Club as well. Since 2018, he has been a curator of the Chandravala program at Archipel, Jakarta International Documentary and Experimental Film Festival. And in July 2019, he presented his curatorial on Asia Forum on 3-4-X's Experimental Film and Video Festival in Seoul, South Korea. His latest films are Jakarta Unfair and Into the Dark. Then we also have with us David. David Dalmadi is a film director and editor from the city of Padang, West Sumatra in Indonesia. His films have been screened at several international festivals. David is also active in producing archival videos and people's daily lives in West Sumatra, which are updated on the Ingatan Visual YouTube account. In 2018, his film, co-directed with Lydia Afiliata, titled Diary of Cattle, won the pitching competition from Tribeca Film Institute at Dogs by the Sea. Yeah, I'm super happy to, to have all of you here, and I'm really happy also that, that we're going to do this today together. I remember that I met, um, I went to the... To the to a conference, Red, Radical Film Cultures conference or meet up in Berlin. Now already a couple of years ago, and United Streams was doing a presentation back then on on the project, and especially also talking about some of the themes and questions you you were been thinking about um, over over this this project. And then I realized as I have been. Yeah, I didn't introduce myself, <laughs> but I'm a <laughs> filmmaker and anthropologist, and I'm doing, I've spent a lot of time recently, um, over the past couple of years in Indonesia, doing, um, research on film, film collectives in, in Indonesia. And that's also how, how we met. So when, when we were in, when I was in Berlin, I realized that the questions you were thinking about in United Screens and the questions we were thinking about in Indonesia are actually quite similar. And so we, yeah, this is kind of how it started and how we wanted to, to start exploring, um, different kinds of question of how can independent film communities, collectives organize. And in my, I want to just give a brief introduction and then also leave both, most of the space to you. Um, but in, in my dissertation, I, like, I've come to think about this, this whole, filmmaking and producing alternative content that is not not part of the mainstream and but also creating new languages new aesthetics that are of course aware of the mainstream but maybe some at some 
at points decidedly different and also creating these spaces what is happening a lot in Indonesia that really spaces for screening and for dialogue are created um, which Archipel is one one of the, the um, bodies doing that and I think that all of this I, I like to think of it as yeah as this kind of uh, production of alternative knowledges and I think when we when we step back a bit and I always like to think about things also on on the meta level there is a desperate need for other ways of knowing the world and especially in in a place like Indonesia I think with a with a colonial past that is not a past but it's still a colonial present um, yeah we also have to think about the, this yeah, that like it was not a colonization only of the the place that ended when the colonizers left the country, but it's much more deeper and so pervasive. And so the production of like every kind of alternative knowledge is not not really um, it's not really recognized in school. It's not it's a question of legitim legitimization in the end for me. And I think what what cinematic practice does is to to kind of open the question again, how can we know, how can we sense, how can we learn from each other? And I, yeah, I got really inspired and also hopeful by by working with, with film collectives in Indonesia, because I think this is, to me, this is exactly this like alternative modes of collective knowledge production and also dissemination. And it's like this, This I recommend everyone to, to read this book. I think it's really, it's, yeah, when I read the book, I felt like exactly the same thing, like, oh, like someone else is thinking about the same things, but in a completely different context and maybe not even knowing about each other. But I think the desire is kind of the same. And um, yeah, and this also links to uh, to other questions of and what we've been thinking about, what I think about in my dissertation, but also what um, United Screens is uh, thinking about. And like now we are on this platform, which is kind of organized by technology. So we were also thinking about questions like how can technology build community and how can it nurture also community? And what, yeah, what are the questions we maybe need to ask ourselves? And people asked, like in the previous rushes, there was a lot of talking about what can, can there be platforms like technology, users of technology outside of capitalism and all these questions. And then something I'm really interested in is also what is the, the grammar of relation making with, of humans and not more than humans and technology that is, yeah outside of these modes of capitalist um, and extractivist modes of production. But at the same time, it seems to be very, very difficult to completely unplug cultural practice from, from capitalism, which is like everywhere. But collectivity is, is something that, that we talked about a lot in Indonesia and also after I, I went back to Germany. Now I'm in Bangkok and I think it's still it's still an ongoing topic that I'm very excited about <laughs> and happy to, to talk to you about. And this this kind of community based cinematic practice as as an alternative mode of knowledge production. Um yeah, I, I will leave it just here um and give turn over to you. Um yeah. So maybe um, Duha will tell us now a little bit about the history of Archipel and just give give the content, um, yeah, the context exactly. Because maybe some some of the audiences don't have never heard of Archipel, have never heard of Indonesia. <coughs> so we yeah we will just hear about how this collective formed, also how he joined, and then um, yeah, also at the same time think about the role of, of video and film technologies to to form kind of this particular way of Indonesian aesthetic and I'm yeah thank you so much for being here I'm very excited for hearing more from you all right um, in this discussion I think uh, it will be better for me to speak in Bahasa Indonesia yes. yeah. so first let's go here Okay, saya akan mulai bahasa Indonesia. 
So the main thing to achieve in Russia's five, as offered by Rosalia, is to see and explore the potential of community-based cinematic practice as an alternative mode of collective knowledge production and dissemination. A little information about Indonesia as well as the meaning of community and collective and also cinema. I think it is needed uh, to, to allow all of you uh, in your own locations or in your respective countries can understand the context whether the social, cultural, political and so on from what work, from what will be discussed today. Uh, I am I was born in Jakarta in 1995, three years before the occurrence of what was called as reformasi or the 1998 political reform in Indonesia. This is a kind of marker for the end of Suharto's authoritarian New Order regime. This moment is an important period in the discourse regarding the community or collective in Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia previously was Dutch East India Geopolitically, it is included in the category of the third world, a country full of the history of European colonialism and imperialism, especially by the Portuguese, Spanish, French, British, Dutch, from VOC to Kingdom, and then Japan until 1945. In relation to cinema, according to the research of Daphna Rupin, it was still in a colonial situation. Uh, that was for the first time moving image, in this case, the cinematograph invented by the Lumiere brothers, was played in the Dutch East Indies to be precise in the in the 1896, only a year after it was screened in Paris, France in 1895. Asti will elaborate more on this. And then back to the reform in 1998, no less than 33 years earlier, Indonesia was hegemonized by the pro-investor New Order Development ideology. One thing that is common in the era of colonialism and that era is also regarding the forced modernization. It related to social crisis, cultural crisis, ecological crisis, and ecologic uh, And then toward the latter, there is an interesting phenomenon. Ong Ho Kham writes that during the economic depressions of the 1930s in the Dutch East Indies, there is a dissertation by Dicke, published in 1910, which offered the theory of dualism, and that book was very widely printed. This theory sees an opportunity that the capitalist Western economic theory, such as applied to plantations in order to accumulate capital and collect profits, and indigenous economic theory, such as in villages, with the principle of gotong royong, or, or things we do together, to have equal, equal taste, equal experience and everything, which are the non-capitalists can be combined. The narrative of Gotong Royong, or things we do together, which is considered the nature of Eastern society, is used to save the economy, or primarily to save the interests of the rulers and the stability of the state, which in that period was the Dutch East Indies colonial government. Then similar but not the same, the mutual cooperation narrative, or Gotong Royong narrative, was subsequently used by the New Order government in the name of development that Suharto as the father of development invited citizens or all family members to work hand in hand for the national economy as a method of obtaining free labor. Both lead to the 
markets due to the landlord economic crisis and ecological crisis and etc gotong royong which is an is the spirit of togetherness and sharing Or roughly translated to cooperation and community, the spirit of volunteerism and solidarity, and working together for the benefits of the residents living in the same community, it becomes a control instrument to foster public obedience. So those who are obedient are those who will endure, and this includes various aspects of life from social, political, cultural, economic, mass media, and so on. All are centralized. Reforms attempted to destroy the centralized model. The reform attempted to destroy the centralized model, and that's a little context about Indonesia. And then about community or collective. The fall of the authoritarian uh, uh, government gave rise to the spirit, if not euphoria, freedom euphoria. of expression, Dari, uh, something that in the authoritarian era was very uh, much lacking, especially dijaga, regarding ya. political expression and expressing opinions that was different from the government's narrative. The independent uh, film community of Rumah Cinema, Cinema Yogyakarta noted uh, that from 1999 until 2008, there were at least 50 film communities, 25 film festivals were held, and 350 indie films were produced, which on average consisted of short films. In addition to that, in 1998, in Hafi study of the ontology of Indonesian fine arts in criticism and essay, Hafiz is the founder of Forum Lenteng. Uh, it became an important momentum in the development of media technology use in the general public, in this case especially the video medium. So I will not talk about technology in a sophisticated term, blockchain etc. But in this case, I want to talk about video technology. So ordinary people, thanks to the start of democracy, ordinary people have the opportunity to produce their own information by using video. The growth of independent film community network and the development of video medium are also important parts of the development of short films, video art, and media art. Based on research on the distribution of video technology in society in the digital era, in the realm of art discourse, there is an important marker that is the emergence of OK Video Jakarta International Video Festival in 2003. That is the first video art biennale, international biennale for the first video art in Southeast Asia. However, apart from the euphoria in society, this period also marks a significant growth in the media industry, particularly private television. During the transition from the authoritarian regime of the new order to the democratic reformation, there was a kind of gap in knowledge and criticism in the realm of arts and culture, including also media knowledge. In order to learn about this, in 2003, the Forum Lenteng, which was dominated by students of journalism study, was established as a study group which specifically studied the history of audiovisual and film. The first project that was carried out in Mutual Corporation was the Mushroom Project, which produced nine documentary videos about Jakarta. You can access it at Kubu Web slash Kubu.com or more information on the YouTube channel of Juna Footage. There will be a link below and you can also read the catalog by clicking on this picture. Shortly, the classes, workshops and projects regarding video 
It was all summarized in the video based exhibition in 2009. In the realm of mass media, the growth of the television industry and private media has led to media conglomeration. Information production is centralized again and it has centralistic character still within the framework of the accumulation of capital. So Forum Lenteng then formed a program called Akumasa. Akumasa program. Akumasa program is divided into four phases. The first one is media literacy. This is a media empowerment program related to the massive spread of video camera technology, which enables the production of community-based information or citizen journalism. And here uh, we open space for small narratives, culture, myths, and distribution of vernacular images to appear. This phase took place in 2012 as a response to the increasingly growing media conglomeration, and it was continued with the phase of media criticism, Akumasa Bernas, and then the last one is art project that was started in 2016 through Bangsal Menggawe Festival in uh, Pemenang, North Lombok. At least there are 12 local communities spread across Indonesia that are involved in this Akumasa program. I think David can talk about his experience of being involved in the Akumasa program and maybe also how this gotong royong or mutual cooperation works in this context. You can view all the documentation and about 1,000 of his writings uh, of these writings of Akumasa by clicking on this Akumasa logo. And then for the documentary videos uh, from each location, from the 12 local communities that was involved in Akumasa, you can also click on this image. Or you can also search it in the journal footage channel in YouTube. And then in 2013, Forum Lenteng Form Archipel Jakarta International Documentary and Experimental Film Festival. It took about 10 years for Forum Lenteng to have dialogue, research, uh, build networking in order to finalize the idea for this annual film festival. That a festival is not only a meeting space for films and their audiences, but it also needs to be a vehicle for the production and reproduction of knowledge regarding social, political, economic, and cultural matters through cinema. This year is its 8th edition. You can view all the documentation by clicking on this logo. For more details regarding the history of the programs in Forum Lanteng, you can watch the following video. Here is the trailer from the first archipel and for more detail regarding the history of programs in Forum Lanteng, you can also watch it by clicking this logo and then I will shift to the program I created Archipel Chandrawala Chandrawala is the program that I curate in Archipel it was started in 2016. David's film titled David's film titled Jembatan Sibuk has become one of the curated films. You can read the introduction and historical background of why Chandrawala was formed in this image. Please, you can click the description. And then uh, for Archipel, or at least in my opinion, the biggest motive of Chandrawala initiation was the need to encourage film discourse 
in the realm that relates to socio-cultural issues, activism, and contemporary political developments. Through that, or through this initiative, film will not only be an entertaining spectacle, although it needs to be uh, an entertainment too, but it can also become a means of study. Uh, I know that it's not a new idea actually, but I think my generation is used to watch films naturally simply as entertainment. The generation who was born in the, in the early 90s uh, until 2000, they watch film just simply as entertainment. Although in fact, in its history, cinema has also become part of how a generation records its civilization. For this reason, we can conduct studies to imagine how civilization in the past and then through language and aesthetics. Perhaps we can also imagine also the future civilization through what is happening today by tracing how this generation recorded its civilization or the rest of civilization that preceded it. Uh, for instance, uh, like what David did. Through Chandrawala Kurachuriel, apart from mapping, there are also some posters in here uh, from year to year. You can click it. Through Chandrawala Kurachuriel, apart from mapping, it also encourages the effort to discover or formulate film aesthetics that are aware of the context of change and development of media, social, political, and cultural in Indonesian society. In the last two Chandrawala curatorial, you can check it here in the last part. I am more focused to pay attention to the films that are quiet explicit in terms of its verbal language in talking about politics such as identity politics religious fundamentalism and past human rights crimes especially when Suharto coops Sukarno and massacred parts of the Indonesian Communist Party or those who are suspected of adhering to communism uh, while in Chandrawala this year in the Twilight Zone Chandrawala I try to be, you can watch the explanation about what is Twilight Zone according to Archipel by watching the interview of the head selector uh, with the head selector Oti Widesari in this video. There is a link in the description. Apparently from the films this year, I try to be more strict in choosing films by seeing the visual quality and the experimentation it offers. And it turns out that the most qualified films for this year's submission all talks about landscape. They are not bothered by stories. So it's more like recording of what is in everyday life or what is in front of the filmmakers. So I choose, I select four films uh, and after a discussion with Oti as the head selector, it leads me to discuss the idea of the death of the author. Thus, the curatorial for Chandrawala this year, you can also click the image. So it's about landscape and authorship. To discuss the issue of filmmaking style, I try to remember and read again a bit of film history. Then to discuss landscapes, I revisited the literature on fine arts. And both of them are more focused in Indonesia. In my opinion, since the since coming from its origin until it arrived in the Dutch East Indies, film has always been influenced by the economic, social, cultural, and political landscape in which film is located. So, for instance, in the context of Akumasa, is where the video is located, and as well as its aesthetic. Uh, aesthetic ideology or aesthetic flow uh, various aesthetic in world cinema were born it was a response to every change that occurs in these landscapes and it is 
possibly uh, and the born of this kinds of aesthetic is made possible only if the filmmakers are aware of the landscape including the landscape in a more physical sense for example Italian neorealism films will not be born in a country that won the World War II and Ozus Tatami shot is inseparable from Japanese culture and architecture And in this context, at first I have uh, mentioned it at the beginning, the various political fluctuations that occurred in Indonesia, colonialism and the over area of freedom, the proliferation of religious fundamentalism and etc. So until today, there has never been a film aesthetic that can be called as Indonesian film aesthetic, change in the economic, social, cultural and political landscape throughout Indonesia's history have never produced any film aesthetics. In contrast to the situation with art, which in the realm of criticism is also more passionate regarding landscapes, for example, physical and non-physical. There is a kind of battle discourse on the aesthetics of Indonesian fine arts, especially the polemic of Mui in the painting, which is considered very close to Romanticism and is considered to cater to the taste of the colonialists and the realism painting attempts to present the reality of the people. This is not the case in the film. When the production of Indonesian films for cinema was sluggish in the 1993, uh, Rosihan Anwar, the chairman of the Sociocultural Commission of the National Film Council at that time, he recommended the producer to produce Back to Basic Film as a solution. In order to gain audience, the entertaining formulas such as comedy, spice with sex, or upheld. The audience in this context is of course related to the accumulation of capital and profits alone. So reviewing the history uh, of Indonesia since the production of Lutung Kasarung 1926 during the Dutch East in this era uh, and then also the long march in the 1950 in the early days of independence the establishment of the cinematographic academy in jakarta in 1971 and the film crisis in the 1990s the search for indonesian film aesthetic has never really been carried out it seems that the back to basic recommendation in the last period of film production which is a reflection of indonesian films before they finally die for a moment There is no more opportunity for the desire for authorship and we are increasingly moving away from efforts to formulate Indonesian film aesthetic. After that, the only reference was the Hollywood film aesthetic. Because of that, after going through various discussions, I proposed the discourse on landscapes and authorship as a frame for curatorial. The landscape clearly keeps a history of all the political fluctuations that occur in the location. If we are still passionate about finding Indonesian film aesthetics, returning to the landscape is a sensible choice. This curatorial compilation of film shows how landscape, both physically and conceptually, have shaken the authorship position in film. And it is uh, possible when film technology and various vocabulary in the completeness of knowledge about it are already owned by the people and various landscapes. The landscape that is used solely as the backdrop for the film story, without its ability to talk back, now in these four films, they have the ability to talk back to the film. 
This ability makes landscape and film have a questioning relationship. What is film reality and what is landscape reality? So ultimately, the landscape can truly conquer the authorship or rather the landscape skill the authorship. A director who realizes the potential of the landscape as the aesthetic language of film for instance like David, uh, those filmmakers only need to analyze the landscape and intervene it by putting down the camera and compiling the footage. With that, it is possible to produce a film about landscape that talk about itself. If Barthes has ever said that the part of a spectator must be paid for the death of the author, it seems that today authorship must be willing to be killed once again for the part of Indonesian film aesthetic. And then from the production aspect, I think this kind of filmmaking can only be done with a only small team and by working together. Such a working model has been tested in the Akumasa program. Uh, David will talk about it later and in fact there is no need for a director just an ordinary citizens can do it and they are the ones who actually know the landscape around them the best the logic is media empowerment or technology empowerment the motive for film production is of course not for seeking the capital gain but for the production and reproduction of knowledge especially those in the people's versions of the narrative Marginalized narratives or in vernacular areas. I think that this can be practiced in various places by anyone in mutual cooperation or collectively. And I'm not, uh, I'm not too sure because I haven't finished reading the book. But maybe this is in line with Boaventura de Sousa Santos thesis, which states that an epistemological shift is needed to restore the idea that there are alternatives, and this needs to be recognized as a container for potential alternatives, the struggle against oppression that is constantly championed in the world. The struggle against oppression needs to be keep being uh, strived, and the shift lies in the so-called certain epistemology, with its main thesis that if we must change the world while constantly reinterpreting it, such as what has been done by the neoliberalism on capitalism, then we need to constantly reinterpret it through production of film and video because like the change itself, the interpretation of the world is a collective effort that needs to be done together. Perhaps that's all from me. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating to kind of get the whole history, the political context. And it always makes me like when, when you speak about these things, it, it always becomes very clear that there is not really the local situation and the global, but it's like from the beginning on, it was so, so entangled. And yeah, I, I learned a lot from thinking about how, where, where this kind of Indonesian film aesthetics is coming from and also how it's still something that is up for grabs and constantly in in negotiation with, with the context. And yeah, I like when you said that, that there are alternatives and I'm really happy that now we have David. Um, and yeah, I'm super happy because I think it's good, like you, you kind of enter the, the film community's ecosystem from, from different... Like you are more on the organizing side, but also a filmmaker. But David was um, part of like one of his like he was he joined one one of the workshops I think or several, and so it was an ongoing relationship. And then one of his films was screened, and now we're gonna talk about like one of his films. Yeah. So David. Yeah. So I'm super happy that we also have David with us today because he's. Um, yeah, he's kind of coming from, from the same ecosystem but from different positionality. And um, I think you have been involved with Archipel and from Lenting over a couple of workshops that you did. And also you did a film that was screened, selected and screened in the Chandravala. So we are very excited to hear more about the film that you did, but also your practice more in general and how how you came to filmmaking and, and all of these things. Yeah, so thank you so much for, 
for being here and taking time to to talk to us. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. Uh, saya bisa mulai sekarang? Ya, yeah, bisa mulai. Bahasa Indonesia okay. aja. <laughs> okay. You can follow me up above to Akumasa. All right. Thank you, Rosalia. My name is David, David Darmadi. I am a filmmaker and I live in Padang, Indonesia. Uh, my initial encounters with videos and films started when I was in first grade actually. So at that time, uh, I was like 12 years old. At that time, I watched a film in my neighbor. Uh, he played by using a laser disc. The film that was shown at that time was a war film. And for the audio, they used a quiet large speakers and the sound is very strong so when i watch it i feel like i'm getting immersed into the film so for a year i keep on waiting for them to screen film again and again so i think that was my first interest to uh, toward film and i want to get to know and get into the film further but uh, as a knowledge i start to learn and study both film and video when I went to college it was in 2007 after a year uh, I study in the college uh, I met uh, uh, my uh, film community it's called Akumasa at that time I made a com film community the name was Sarwe and then Forum Lenteng came to our place and Forum Lenteng introduced us to a program called Akumasa program. So I also think that I also think that around that time is is uh, it was the beginning of film production that is not centralized in Jakarta. Uh, when Akumasa came, uh, Akumasa also introduced uh, introduce us uh, concept about video that is quite interesting for me, in which the knowledge uh, of the of the film is not only about just the story, and during the process, I'm quite surprised. Uh, of I'm su quite surprised to what they offer because they try to introduce us to films such as Man with a Movie Camera, Nanook of the North, and also the Lumiere Film Collection. At that time, I was not very much familiar to what those films because because uh, my uh, my study, uh, the film study in my college was quite new. It was just one year old in my university when I enrolled it. So it is still in the development phase. When we talk about the film community at that year, uh, actually uh, in my city, there was not much film community in my city at that time. But if you want to look at the number of its production, mostly the film co mostly the films are produced uh, from the students in my university where I took study on film, and we have started to use. We use video to make films, but our understanding about video is still very much limited if you want to talk about the aesthetic tendency at that time 
actually a film that they understand is just how to make story and then it is it is realized by using the technical in the video and by using the camera and acting but there is something also quite interesting at that time the understanding of the film productions that were considered as serious at that time by my friends it was just a fiction film productions because fiction uh, film productions uh, it takes massive people and then the preparation is quite complex meanwhile documentary films only needs only needs uh, only needs more simple uh, more simple production process so it seems like it is less serious than uh, fiction so there is that's a kind of uh, perspective that grows at that time and then i want to go back to akumasa and also sarwe at that time when we make films we never think about how the strategy for the distribution and in fact we did not really think about that but at least we can make film at that time and we can screen it for the people and then we make uh, when akumasa came it is very interesting because akumasa also introduced to us about how to distribute uh, our films but at that time at the time the video is in forum lenteng sometimes it is very interesting when we screen uh, the films that we make uh, from this akumasa program at that time we try to promote it by carrying speaker from the mosque like a horn horn speaker from the mosque and then we use it in the car to just uh, promoting the, the, the films by bringing this speaker trumpet from us using a pickup car and then we toured the city of Padang Panjang to remote villages in Padang Panjang announcing that there will be a screening of a film about Padang Panjang and it's free and the audience become really boomed an old man who become the projectionist cried as he came forward to give a speech before the film started he cried because it had been very long time since he had seen this Korea cinema uh, cinema at uh, Padang Panjang it was filled with spectators I try to see again how film production that is not centralized only in Jakarta at that time I can see a like a dissemination in the cities outside uh, in the cities in Indonesia how films can be produced by their own and then it can be screened there by their own too so they make their own film they screen it in their location and also for the people there i think it is very interesting this practice conducted by forum lenteng through akumasa at that time and after quite a long time let's follow me here to this video And by departing from that, from the videos uh, from Akumasa, I can also see that there is a kind of possibility that video, that by using video, we can also record not only for making film, but we can also record a kind of knowledge and also culture and also the social situation in the in uh, the social situation in a certain location perhaps it is what 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 was done in the early colonial period in indonesia i see that perhaps i can also do that and then 
at last I try to build uh, like an idea to make an archive uh, to make an archive regarding the locations in my city there are some videos that I make there are also landfill uh, and then sugar cane So, so I started in 2016 until in the mid 2017 because I work on this project on my own and it doesn't work very well actually. Finally, I am interested to record a landfill in the Padang. This is the video and, and then this one will be will be made into film Diary of Kettle. I want to tell you the process of working on this film. The research process uh, during the making of this film, just like I mentioned previously, this is from the video archive project that I have done since 2016. So since that year, we have recorded activities in Padang. And then in the midst 2017, I went to this landfill and then I found out something very surprising because I uh, encountered the cattle, uh, the cows who live there. At the time, I didn't want to rush it into making it uh, making it a film or a video i just want to know more and i conduct more research and then uh, i just try to find out some funding for the film and i try to apply it and at the time my target is just to gain financing for this film the basic financing ones so i just think that way But what happens is really beyond my expectation. This film becomes a very important important film to talk about environmental issues. And this film also uh, was screened in many film festivals in Indonesia and international film festivals. And it also entered a Chandrawala program, just like what Duha talked about. And from this program, from this diary of cattle, I started to learn to see again, to look at again the strategy of financing and also distributions to make a film. When I try to compare from before working in the community until now, finally I see that the independent film productions and the commercial film productions they both of them are just actually the same we also need to think about financing we need to think about how to distribute these films after it is finished because so far what was in the what is in the films of many filmmakers uh, especially those who are outside Jakarta independent films it's just like a learning process to hate into for them to go into the commercial filmmaking I think that way of framework that way of thinking it needs to be changed because film is not only about uh, being screened in the commercial cinema, I think, because film also needs needs to have and also it has other spaces. Film also have other spaces, just like uh, center of cultures and also festivals. Here is the uh, the photograph during the film making production process, uh, especially when I make diary of cattle, and I want to talk further.
I want to talk further about the process of distributions of this film. So, so when we try to select the premiere for the Diary of Kettle, I try to choose an international festival that has an echo and a promising name in the festival circuit. Uh, I know that there were several medias that want to also record. I want to make sure that the idea that I want to deliver through this film will reach the audience well. We also try to find out distributors from Europe and outside Europe. Uh, now this film is uh, is in one of the distributor in France. And after that, after the distribution, there was also another stage that want to be reached by this uh, film. That is the impact, uh, the impact of this film. There are many film documenters uh, only, only finished in the realm of the filmmakers or the film people. So the talk is only about the aesthetic. In the realm of the films, how so? But how about the people, just common people outside the film circle, outside the film ecosystem? How? What kind of the impact received by these common people that really don't talk about the aesthetic and extra? I expect that uh, people can just see see things uh, beyond the films. Actually, what what is what wants to be reached by the filmmaker? What the filmmakers want to do for the wider public. So in this diary of Kettle, I try to talk about environmental issues, and then we try to and we try to kind of uh, promote how people can can use less plastic through this film. So after. This film reach the distribution phase. This film also reach people who works in the activist uh, realm. For instance, the environmental activists. So I hope that film will not only be finished in the distribution realm, but it can also reach something further. So I hope it's not only just about the artistic or the aesthetic, but it can also reach the impact. Uh, there is a trailer in here for the Diary of Kettle. You can click it here. And here is also the photographs from the films that have been screened. This is the screening. There is one in the Singapore and then Vision to Real, and also in the Spain. And now, if I want to talk about the film ecosystem in Indonesia, especially in independent, independent film ecosystem and the aesthetic tendency. I think the ecosystem of ecosystem of film in Indonesia before the pandemic, in term of production, there is an abundance production productions of film, and it is not centralized in Jakarta anymore. So it happens in many cities. There is a spirit to produce films to make films. And then, with the productions of film has been widely disseminated. I mean, in the independent realm, I want to see that the independent and commercial area is it needs to be equal. The obstacles faced by independent filmmakers are mostly in appreciating themselves in term of profession, professional payment. So 
when they have money they make film but But when I make film, I also need to consider not only the production budget for the film, but also my own professional payment. This ideal payment is still an obstacle in some film community. Meanwhile, in the aesthetic realm, from some films that I have watched, Indonesian films are still tend to lean and being dependent on the structure of its narratives. If we want to look at the Hollywood classic tradition, the global aesthetic arts is still very strong. For me, it is not problematic at all. But there is something that they forget. They forget to actually manage and also process this story in terms of aesthetic. In terms of cinematography, mise en scene, and sound and editing. Now I try to take an example. For instance, uh, Sumanjaya film, Sidul Anak Modern, or roughly translated as Dul Son of the Modern. What is interesting for me is uh, Sumanjaya element of my song scenes in selecting the actors for the characters of Dul and Ahmad. Uh, Sidul Anak Modern is the story about uh, a native Betawi who went to Jakarta and to find something. This native boy faced uh, the development in Jakarta, that is modernity. What makes it very aesthetic is when he chose the characters of, of the actors. Uh, he chose he chose Benjamin to play the role of Dul, the native Betawi, and the other character is Ahmad, played by Ahmad Albar. So Ahmad Albar, it's become the representation of the concept of modern that want to be attained at that time. For me, the mass action is very interesting because when Dul played by Benjamin, when Dul went to Jakarta, he want to change himself to be the modern boy, just like Ahmad's character. But then the face of Benjamin, no matter how you change it, it will always carry the sense of native Betawi. And then I think there is a sense of my Asa'ang in the in choosing the characters. So the problem is just when you want to persist in the in the storytelling structure, but how to just manage it not by by not forgetting the element of artistic too in the film. Terima kasih David. Saya sangat suka, uh, uh, saya belajar banyak tentang ini. Buat saya, ini juga tempat yang sangat uh, spesial kan, untuk belajar bagaimana mempelajarinya, bagaimana membicarakan konteks, bagaimana riset dilakukan tentang sebuah konteks.
Okay, just let's follow me here. Let's follow me here. Up, up, up. Let's go up. Let's go up. Okay. So, I am part of the researchers in Kutu Cinema since 2019. But before that, I was manager of the Kutu Cinema in 2018. And since then, I was involved as one of the researchers. So, Kutu Cinema is one of Archipel's program. Archipel Jepata International Documentary Experimental Film Festival. Mahardika Yuda leads it as a curator. And here we try to understand how the distribution of cinema technology influence our life. When the cinema enters and grows in Indonesia, how the cinema becomes part of Indonesia society life. So that's the purpose of Kutu Cinema. The purpose of Kutu Cinema is very simple indeed. That is to allow us, the Indonesians, to understand better and then able to write our own history of cinema by using our own perspective. Aside from that, Kutu Cinema always try to give other offers regarding the use of archives in the exhibition. If the archives in the form of text, who write about the who write about it? And if it's a visual or audiovisual, who did record it? For whose interest is the object being archived? What institution is doing in the archive? And what kind of process the object goes through before it ends up at the archiving institution? Uh, I talked with Mahardika Yuda. He said that the emergence of digital technology actually bring a gift from us in the analog period or before 2000. Archives are very difficult to access, but because of the existence of the digital and the internet, it becomes very much easier for us to access the technology, the, the archive. And from that, we try to give other offers to, to, to use the archives in the exhibition. So that archives as the factual material needs to be reinterpreted and needs to also expression experience study and then how to invite the audience not to be passive as the spectator but to be more involved in the exhibition so that how the bodies are also presented in the archive how the body of the spectators are involved in the archives itself the first term raised by Kutu Cinema is Cinema in the Colonial Period Moving Image Colony Exhibition, the first one, it's Lumiere We try to unfold the newborn of cinema So the spread of cinema technology in Asia, Latin Africa, Latin America, I'm sorry, and the Africa become the focus of this exhibition one of it is by presenting how the European fantasy toward its colonies area and especially that is in this through the moving image technology. Referring to the research conducted by Daphne Rutin, this technology first entered Indonesia in 1896 by a photographer and a broadcast entrepreneur named Louis Talbot. This certainly shook the general view that film first entered the Dutch is in this in the 1900. It was not the state that brings it in, but the private sector instead. The film recording followed the spirit of its contemporaries at that time. Many film companies sent camera operators. At that time, uh, the term was not known as the director or cineasty. But the person in charge of operating the camera was called as the camera operator. So, these camera operators went to around the world. 
Several regions such as Asia, Africa, and Latin America are still under Western colonization, and therefore the camera has become a kind of intermediary for the obsession of people in the West to see their faraway colonies. So you can see in here, this is a gift from the film archive that that jongler Japanese or Japanese juggler in English from the catalog Lumiere.com. There are actually three series: jongler Japanese, Dong Japanese, and Luther Japanese. The camera opter in this film is Alexandre Promio. Uh, he is one of the camera opters at the Lumio Film Company. So from this young Le Japonie film, we think this is very interesting. The recording of these three films that the pic the Dutch is in this was not done in the in this. The recording's location is in Crystal Palace in Sydenham. The location of the great exhibition that presents works regarding industry, technology, and culture from all countries in the world. The Crystal Palace is also an exhibition site for the colonial society and cultural scene 1851. Here in the YouTube, there is also documentation. You can click it to see further. And then let's move to the second culture cinema to the right side. Moving image colony exhibition the second. The second culture cinema tries to focus on the knowledge migration through cinema technology from Europe to the Dutch is in this here. The knowledge entered the Dutch is in this, including its perspective and perceptions, including also the illusion of cinema technology. Now, in the late 1890s to early 1900s, many films were imported and screened in the Dutch is in this. Here, there is a consequence. Films such as those made by George Méliès, for instance, have shaped the perspective of the Dutchies in the society in seeing the Europeans and Americans, and also vice versa. Vice versa. The films about the Dutchies in this produced by the corporation and the colonial government, both in the form of fiction and documentary, have represented how the life of the people of the Dutchies in this to the global community. Cinema at this point already has a culture of its own. Cinema is also considered to have the power to reveal another dimension, the thin line between reality and fiction. From this thin border, film production was then used for various purposes, such as for the propaganda purposes of the colonial government. And then, and then there is also an archive stored at the I Film Museum Amsterdam, Containing the socialization of the colonial program, which is summarized in the Fun de Colonial Needs and Kids Collection. I cannot, I cannot re, uh, speak Dutch well, but it's writing Fun de Colonial Needs and Goods Collection, Netherlands in the in build, 1912 until 1942. The, in here, there are many indie movie documentaries that presented a variety of sites, customs, and costumes in the Dutch East Indies, which were in line with the Western imagination and imagining the East. So, beyond this documentary, uh, beyond this documentary, there is also a film called Mina Had This Minshu that in Copenhagen and so on. This film is produced uh, by Hate Company from France. And this fiction uh, narrates a story of a servant, native a local servant who works for for uh, Dutch descendants. And this film becomes a sketch of life of the natives that went in further into the life of everyday life from the perspective of the colonial Dutch. It is different from the documentary films that tends to show the landscape, the surface of the physical situation, and the cultural tradition of the Dutchies in this. This film 
shows the constructions of the behavior of the colonial society in perceiving the native people. And you can see the videos here. You can see that this uh, location for the exhibition, there are two. The exhibition divides two groups of film production: first, commercial films, and secondly, the home movies non-commercial. For commercials in the 1930s, are the Chinese folk tales. There are two floors in here. The shows different films you can see it uh, different tones it depicts the reality of the cinema at the time in which the Europeans watch it from the front and the local people watch it from the back so it's like on the other way around we can move to the third future cinema capturing the lights After the idea of cinema had been absorbed by the people of Budachis Hindu, the Bumi Putra or native directors venture to make their own films. They make representation of their self. In the 1920s until 1930s, it became the initial period of how knowledge of producing movie image was absorbed by the Bumi Putra or the natives, especially the wealthy people who had more access to technology from Europe. In its to, uh, the word Bumi Putra here does not refer to a particular race or ethnicity. However, the meaning of Bumi Putra here is people who were born and live in the Dutch East Indies and then identifying themselves as part of the community group in the Dutch East Indies. This exhibition divides two groups of film production, first commercial films and secondly the home movies or non-commercial. For commercial films in the 1930s, other Chinese folk tales and stealth fantasy films were very popular in Indonesia. People uh, like Te Teng Chun, Wong Brothers, and Tan Choi Hock, they are uh, the main capital holders in the Dutch East Indies who also uh, their financiers who also producers and specials in the local audience market so that their films use Malay language they are arguably the pioneers of the film industry in Indonesia because they also uh, compete with the imported films in non-commercial production there is also home movies uh, there is Kwon Zuan Liang, Kwa Zan Liang a head of sugar factory Laboratory in JT Piring. He recorded uh, since uh, 1926 until 1937 about his family's daily life to the situation in the factory. The recording conducted by Kwe Zan Liang is a valuable resource to see how the culture in the Dutch is in this at the time, apart from what was depicted in films that had commercial interest or colonial production. His film also adds to the knowledge of seeing in detail how the intimate life representation of the Chinese Peranakan family, which has been dominated by representations of the lives of Europeans, especially the Dutch, who settled in the Dutch East Indies through their home movies. This is the documentation, and then you can also watch the video. And then we can move to the right. Culture Cinema The Fort. Fate of Huyung. Here we focus on a character named Inatsu Eitaro, or known as Heyong, who then ends up with the name Huyung. This is an interesting life story. In Indonesia, he is known as Dr. Huyung. And I don't know where he got Dr. Epithet, but then he's a Korean who had lived in Japan for a long time. And then changing his name to Inatsu Etaro, 
he worked in the film industry in Japan and then he became uh, Japanese army and worked under the intelligence army of the Japanese during the Japanese military occupation in Indonesia Puyung worked inside Jawa Egeki Kyokai or the Usaha Sandiwara Association in Java it's like a division under Sendenbu or Japanese propaganda office here he make a propaganda film titled Calling Australia who narrate that the Dutch armies were treated very nicely by the Japanese and then in the revolution era in the 1945 until 1949 he remained in Indonesia, becoming a citizen in Indonesia and worked under the Ministry of Information. He was also involved with the Indonesian Film News, a cinema movement that documents various events of the revolutionary struggle. This is a Film News Indonesia number 3. There are three series, number 1, 2, 3. Uh, I show it number 3 in here. Cinema 5. Culture Cinema 5 responds to a major event that occurred in 1963, namely Geneva Games of the New Emerging Forces. The brief background is that when Indonesia hosted the 1962 Asian Games and Indonesia did not invite Israel and Taiwan on the grounds of sympathy for China and Arab countries. This action was protested by the International Olympic Committee or the KOI because Israel and Taiwan are official members of KOI. Finally, KOI suspended Indonesia's membership and Indonesia was suspended from participating in the 1964 Summer Olympics in Tokyo. And so, Sukarno made this Ganevo, not just as a sporty part, sports party. Ganevo is also a cultural event which is planned to take place for every four years. Uh, Ganevo 1963 involved 51 countries and it becomes the first largest sporting event in Indonesia. The main idea of this exhibition, apart from capturing the Ganevo event, it is also how, how the film medium records the perfect bodies which are manifested in the athletes who compete during the sports party. From this body, from these bodies, we can see how filmmakers transmit the spirit of nationalism and anti-imperialism, which is the basis for the vibe for the Ganevo events. Here, you you can we can go further below. In this video, if you click it, you can see the display of the archive of Ganevo projected on the wall. We can also see how the bodies of the spectators can also enter these perfect bodies. If you can see in the YouTube, there is also a Ganevo song. So this is not from uh, Forum, Lenteng, uh, Forum Lenteng YouTube. For not from Forum Lenteng archive, but this is actually netizens archive and we can also find many things uh, many archives in many archives in YouTube and this is uh, FIFA Ganevo song from Ganevo recorded by the netizen and uploaded by the netizen and then we can go to the Sikh Culture Cinema in the Six Culture Cinema, we utilize news film archives as historical sources in this exhibition. This is an attempt to see to what extent a film is able to capture an event, share public perception and perspective, as well as what cinematic and visual elements are contained in the aesthetics of the cinema of Glora Indonesia. News film itself is one type of film that has a long history in Indonesia, apart from being fiction and documentary films. 
So, news films have grown and developed since the time of the Japanese military government in Indonesia from 1942 until 1945. And at that time, the founding fathers of Indonesian cinema honed and deepened their knowledge in film production as well as understanding the ideas and functions of cinema which do not only stop at entertaining value but also have the ability to construct common identity ideas. Then after the transfer of sovereignty after the Roundtable Conference, the state film company began producing two types of news film. The first is Gloria Indonesia and then the second is Special Broadcasting or Sharan Chusus. For Special Broadcast, it's focused on specific issues in each edition. For Gloria Indonesia, it becomes a kind of government diary showing the development of this country. Gloria Indonesia was first published on January 5, 1951. Gloria Indonesia was shown in theaters before the main film was displayed. So people who want to watch films are forced to watch Gloria Indonesia first. The existence of Gloria Indonesia has actually started to be drawn trodden since TVRI, the state-owned television station, aired in 1962. Finally, it was broadcast in 1976. It stops airing in 1976. Uh, at the Culture Cinema 6 exhibition, we only highlight Gloria Indonesia. So, from 1951 to 1976, Gloria Indonesia produced more than 8,800 news films. Of this, 360 reels have been digitized by the National Archives of the Republic of Indonesia and can be accessed by the general public. So in Gloria Indonesia exhibition, there are so many sections. Uh, we we show many sections, and one of the sections is about the work of women, from women by women and about women. We show it in the exhibition. In then 2019, before we made the Gloria Indonesia exhibition, we made a traveling exhibition in Java because we see that Java as the center of the development of cinema culture in Indonesia. In addition to that, the context of this traveling exhibition also refers to the early cinema efforts to approach audiences by bringing the archives to spaces where the public meets. So we have a desire in the future to create a traveling museum that is temporary in nature. That is the goal of culture cinema to make a mobile museum like a night market that can be moved from one city to another throughout Indonesia. So the concept is a museum that reaches to its public rather than the public who reach for its museum. That's all. Thank you, Rosalia. Terima kasih, Rosalia. Thank you Thank so you much. So much. <laughs> um, yeah, that it was super fascinating to also learn a bit how you engage with with already existing filmic images engage with the archive but kind of yeah create create a new archive and in doing so ask all these questions about history and how how the medium has be, came to indonesia how it's been used how it's being used now um i think we also created a kind of like really interesting archive with with all, all that you, you told us um, today. And I'm, I'm already looking forward to, to go back to it and also watch the videos. And I think the people who will, who will listen to our conversations will, will also have an opportunity to, yeah, to, to watch all the videos, to go through the, the material. And I think we learned a lot about like the landscape, about the history, also about the questions that are kind of floating in, in this ecosystem and the entanglements with influences from other countries. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm very, yeah, it's a lot, a lot to think about. I don't want to make it too long, but there's um, one, one question or maybe two questions, let's see, for everyone. And we don't, we don't have to talk too long about it, but I think since this is also part of United Screens and we are also talking to to other like also in our regular like um, Zoom calls. We also talk to to other practitioners from other countries who are somehow engaged in in independent independent um, mm -hmm. filmmaking. 
um, I, I put the quotes because it's yeah, it's a question how how independent and independent from what. But um, in all of your um, talks, the the notion of co collectivity came up, and I think especially today, it's like doing things together. You also when you when you just started the conversation, you said it's actually not me alone. So I I also really like this idea of not really claiming like single authorship, but doing doing things together. So maybe I would be interested to hear from you, like what what do you think? Because you are in a way been you've been doing this for a long time you all have experience in like not only making film but researching um, creating spaces organizing workshops um, what what do you think like what was the thing that that made you yeah that helped you like why why can you still like even if there are so many questions and so many difficulties I think the fact that that we are here today and talking about this and you have so much to tell like so many things that you did is actually quite amazing and so yeah this is my my first question very complexly <laughs> and what what do you think is the thing that that helps you but also like what what are the challenges and I see that it often um independent filmmaking is kind of positioned outside or countering the state but i have the feeling and i would be interested to hear from your personal experience that in indonesia now maybe in the past things i guess were different but now in indonesia it's not really this this black and white like in independent film scene against the state because the one of the exhibitions you you did that you the last one gelora indonesia i think was also in the national museum if i'm not right and i think there's also some some support from the government and often in in uh, conversations that compare like different contexts i think it's also interesting to to look at Indonesia from this and i remember now just as a keyword in one of the the forum festivals um i think or T talked about government empowerment. So how do you okay, what the first part of the question, how how do you what do you feel like is is the thing that helps you or it's not one thing or many things? Like what what keeps you going and why do you think you have been able to do it for such a long time? And how do you feel and think about your practice and the government? Yeah. Um I don't know who wants to start, but yeah, I will just <laughs> Perhaps I will try to answer it first, but perhaps not from the filmmaking practices perspective, but more on the archive. Perhaps in the filmmaking, filmmaking perspective and the project of Akumasa, Duha and also David can answer it. When it comes to the access to the archive, Culture Cinema before 2018-2019 We work without the state So we try to look for the archives on our own At that time I, I did not participate uh, to Culture Cinema yet But this Culture Cinema team uh, try to look for the archives on their own when there is a friend of uh, when one of our friends went to i museum we will ask for help uh, for them to see if there is any archive regarding indonesia there and then uh, in 2019 it is like a moment that is very crucial for us because in 2019 we received archive from Andri, National Archive of Republic of Indonesia, and then we asked for help from the Ministry of Education and Culture of Republic of Indonesia, and then we received funding from the Ministry of Education and Culture, and the archive we received it from the National Archive of Republic of Indonesia. And then, however, the intellectual rights and property rights of the Glora of Indonesia are owned by the company. 
So there is a very complex bureaucracy in here, and here we we try to sit together with these three big institutions, and we we negotiate. Uh, so finally, we can launch this Glora Indonesia exhibition. This is a very important uh, exhibition because we kind of educate the government uh, because because uh, we educate the government because in fact the government today never consider Glora Indonesia as something important meanwhile actually Glora Indonesia is actually a kind of the state's diary in the past I think at 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 the at the, at this stage we kind of conduct uh, government empowerment or educating the government to consider the archives as something crucial and important too. But we have started it uh, from Akumasa in early 2008. Akumasa Akumasa conduct projects in many locations and they conduct recording in many locations and. The archives and the West Sumatra, it can be accessed by community in in the Lombok, and then archives in the community in Lombok, it can also be accessed by people or community in Surabaya. So in term of archive and knowledge, we have been connected to each other uh, in term of knowledge, in term of network of social capital we are very much com connected between communities since a long time ago and it is very and it's really giving us benefits for the community and our ourselves too so we can see and we can read the landscape of indonesia in a more helicopter view but it's also in a micro way we can see it from the smallest aspects because these communities also conduct very much a daily community and then and then something that is not visible by the society it is framed by the community and then by recording it perhaps to how want to add more what makes us or me myself keep working on this what makes me uh, see that forum land what forum land things do is important and also its program in akumasa there is there's a new concept uh, there is proposed by mansur zikri when we the collective or the community that for instance, being considered as uh, concerned toward a certain issue, and then we went to the people. We have a certain term. The term is people empowerment. For Mansur Zikri, this term is quite problematic because it considers that the people are not empowered, and hence uh, they want to empower people. So, the concept offered by Zikri is government empowerment. So, when it comes to the clash of collective between collectives and the government, after the reform, it is not very much feasible, especially between the government and the collective or communities, both in the film or in other aspects. Instead, the government seems to be willing to listen. What we need to do to, for instance, returning the archive from the colonizer state, from the colonial state to Indonesia, for instance. For, for example, uh, the sculptures that was taken from Indonesia, how to return them to here, to Indonesia. The government are more open to ask about what we need to do together now. So I think the word government empowerment is more suitable to the practices conducted in Indonesia. 
by Forum Lenteng, by Aku Masa, by various communities uh, in Indonesia. Regarding why it keeps continuing until now, I think actually it's not because why we survive until now. Because naturally, as I mentioned previously, the interaction between the citizens, between the people in Indonesia, it's very much a character that Uh, supports that kind of interaction to build the collective, to build the community, to gather, to work together, to do gotong royong. It's something that we always do. Perhaps it is affected by our climate, the geography, and it makes it impossible to. Uh, perhaps the climate and the geography uh, makes it impossible to conduct these kinds of. Uh, behavior in the West in which uh, perhaps in winter they need to prepare many things uh, to do something uh, collective uh, in Indonesia it does not happen because we does not require such preparations we can just uh, do everything in the daily basis We, it is possible to be done because we never have to conquer the nature because nature always provides everything for us so dialect always happens in daily basis without us need to be worried about the nature dialogue about sharing about artworks watching films it can also be done without the need to considering about the economical aspect although we also need to actually criticize this uh, that there are also works in the film that needs to be regarded as a professional matter but it is not a big problem too and we can also return to uh, the relations to, with the government I think what can be done it's not being resistance being resistance in terms of being violent or harsh but, but the climate and the ecosystem has allowed us to negotiate to work together with the government to taking uh, taking advantage uh, from each other so it's like equally having advantage from each other Unless in certain topics we need, uh, unless in certain topics we need to be resistance, uh, but in many topics in the art and culture, most things are have been very much open. Most things have been very much open. Why and how you can still work making film for a long time? Bagaimana emosi dan pemikiran? Uh, how's your thinking and your emotions regarding the government? So what keeps you driving and what's your relationship feeling about the government in Indonesia and your practice? Uh, my answer why I still survive in here as a filmmaker because it is my choice. It is actually my choice to be a filmmaker. I consider it as my professional job. I, I, I stay in here as an independent filmmaker not in the and not as a commercial filmmaker it's because independent filmmakers has their own path 
as their online to not always have to think about becoming a commercial filmmaker but when it comes to working with the government there have been many opportunities to actually working with the government to make films to find a financial source to make films although although i have to admit that the work is still uh, i can mention one of the activities made by the government it's called akatara akatara is for film financing at that time i was uh, i was involved in akatara but when i see the opportunities provided by akatara to finance films uh, it is it is bigger the finance provided for the activity akatara instead of the finance for the film making itself But there has been an attempt to go there. There is an attempt to finance film from the government, although the finance is still spent much bigger in the activities itself rather than to the film financing itself. In the filmmaking process, there is also pre-production, productions, and post-production. During this process, there are so many skills that are needed and it needs financial support. My problem is how the independent filmmakers can also think about can also think about uh, giving financial source to the film itself, so it can also keep going. With this process that they need to get through although there is an attempt from the government to support filmmaking uh, but it's still uh, not yet ideal but at least it has been the first step to go there okay thank you so much everyone i think we yeah we put so much out there there's so much to explore i yeah i'm super thankful and i'm really happy that that we that we were able to to create this platform and walk through it it's a it's a very interesting experience <laughs> um yeah i just hope that still despite everything we will meet in person again soon thank you also really to to everyone be behind the scenes for helping to translate helping to organize there was i know there was a lot of lot of preparation and a lot of work from for many people so thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day mm -hmm. Bye -bye. Thank you, Thank you all. <laughs>